If you love Push Black's Black History Year, you'll love our newest podcast called Two Minute Black History. In only two minutes, you'll hear little known stories about our people and reclaim the knowledge we need to take action and advance our community. To move towards the future, you've got to look to the past. Learn the history you didn't get in school. Tune in to Two Minute Black History every Tuesday through Friday, right on the Black History Year feed and wherever you listen to podcasts. Maybe you've seen them. Viral social media posts showing pictures of police officers posing with protesters holding a Black Lives Matter sign. Or maybe you've seen pictures of police officers hugging young black kids who appear openly afraid. These images are promoted often by police departments themselves to show officers in a positive light. They serve the purpose of countering negative narratives and they aim to shape the public's perception by painting cops as kind, friendly, and heroic when the truth just does not reflect this. What this really reflects is copaganda and its pervasive and insidious nature must not only be called out, it must be stopped. This is Jay from Push Black and you're listening to Black History Year. The term copaganda is the marriage of the words cop and propaganda. It refers to the ways media and institutions promote positive portrayals of police officers. It's an effort to glamorize the good cop narrative as an attempt to outweigh the few bad apples public leaders claim exist among police. However, we know the reality is that the entire system is rotten. We know that police frequently cause irreparable harm, kill people without impunity, and terrorize black communities. Copaganda distorts this truth in truly harmful ways. Unfortunately, it's a part of our daily lives and appears in everything, from popular kids' movies to some of America's most watched TV shows. Our guest today is going to help us tune our eyes and ears to catch this phenomenon in practice. Andrea Ritchie is a police misconduct attorney and organizer whose writing, litigation, and advocacy has focused on policing and criminalization of women, especially LGBTQ women of color who've been victims of police violence. She's the author of Invisible No More, a history of state violence against women of color and co-author of No More Police, a case for abolition with Miriam Cabo. She'll reveal the dirty gears behind the mechanism of copaganda, the history of the practice, its secrets and more. But first, here's the story of one family's horrific night and the lie police used to blanket the tragedy. Police attacked a black family, then used the attack to try to pull a fast one, push in a false narrative that has been exposed for the diabolical copaganda it truly is. Copaganda is when police, AKA the cops, distort reality to create propaganda that shines a glowing light on themselves. In 2021, Philadelphia police attacked and beat a black woman in her car and proceeded to take her child. Once they had the child, the nation's largest police union, the Fraternal Order of Police, posted deceptive propaganda that painted a completely different picture about what happened. In a now deleted tweet, they tried to sell the lie that Quote, this lost child was wandering around barefoot during the violent riots in Philadelphia. The only thing this Philly police officer cared about was protecting this child. End quote. Little did they know the truth had been caught on camera. They left out the fact that they had bashed in the car windows with the child still inside the vehicle. They also tried to conceal the fact that they brutally attacked the woman's teen nephew as well. According to the family's lawyer, 
police attacked them shortly after instructing them to turn around. It doesn't matter if it's images of police dealing with protesters, playing with black kids, or a police TV show. Copaganda is everywhere. It's up to us to not fall for their anti-black lies. Andrea, what does black liberation look like to you? Uh, Black liberation is a world where every black girl, woman, queer, trans, non-binary person, and everyone they love has everything they need to thrive and reach their highest human potential. So it's a world in which um, we're no longer valued by what we produce. We are valued simply for being who we are. We're able to live in to the fullness of not only our blackness and our gifts, but into the fullness of black love. Can you describe how your work contributes to uh, getting our community closer towards a vision of black liberation? The vision I just shared is deeply informed by black feminist tradition, by the Cumbahee River Collective, and the notion that you know, when Black women, queer and trans people and non-binary people are free, everybody is free because we live at the intersections of multiple and interlocking oppressions and our freedom necessitates and our liberation necessitates the dismantling of all those systems of oppression. So my work has, for most of my life, focused on the frontline enforcers of those systems of oppression who are the police and all of the systems that they Uh, manufacture, uphold, and and protect. For most of my life, I've been focused on really bringing to light, particularly Black women, girls, and trans folks' experiences of policing. Um, But of course, that implicates the entire Black community's experiences of policing. Highlighting all the ways in which policing never has and was never intended to create any kind of safety or well-being for our communities. Can you describe, uh, just at a high level, you know, what brought you to the work that you do? When I'm introducing myself, want to make clear that I'm a Black woman, that I'm a lesbian, that I'm an immigrant. Not just because those things are not necessarily apparent from looking at me, but because they have always profoundly shaped who I am and, and what I do and how I do it. And so those are the things that I think have shaped how I move into the work. Um, I also, you know, was very much involved in the anti-apartheid struggle in my formative college years. And that also really shaped my understanding of police, again, as the frontline enforcers, literally, of systems of apartheid and racial capitalism that I was uh, fighting. And also the role of Black women, both as targets of that state violence and as resistors to it. And and that very much shaped um, the work that I uh, moved into once I um, left college and and began organizing around both um, interpersonal and community violence and the violence of policing and and centering Black women in all of those conversations. You've mentioned policing as an impediment to the vision for Black liberation. uh, And you've also positioned community as I'd say is an alternative to policing in terms of sources of safety and security. Police has become so much a part of our day-to-day lives that it's hard to even imagine what it looks like without some kind of police function in our lives. Describe for us, how is policing an impediment to that vision of Black liberation? And why should we be looking to community more? The first thing I think of is that police are in the way of black liberation because they're in our imagination as the only way to achieve safety, even though for the vast majority of black people, they are a source of violence, not safety. And, and to the extent that they do show up, it's, it's like a game of Russian roulette, what's going to happen. Right. So I think the other really critical piece that often gets missed is that police get in the way of our vision for black liberation by looting the resources that we need 
to achieve it when they're stealing, you know, 40 to 60% of, of our collective financial resources in, in cities across the country, and particularly in cities with high black populations like Detroit or Chicago or uh, Milwaukee or other, other places, that's literally what's keeping, then, then libraries are closing, schools are closing, children don't have books, teachers don't have supplies. We lit- don't have the things that we need in order to create the world that that I was describing or that others are dreaming in terms of black liberation. And, and so they, they get in the way by occupying our imagination as the only possible source of safety, even as they deny it and, and provide the opposite of it, which is violence. They steal our imaginations and they steal the resources we need to achieve and build the communities we want. So that there's, and then of course there's the ways in which when we do try and build the, the resources we need or find safety in community with each other, those responses are criminalized. So often people are engaged in, whether it's informal violence interruption, Eric Garner was breaking up a fight, Joshua Blake was breaking up a fight, right? People experience violence when they're trying to take care of their communities, cops step in. Often um, violence interrupter programs talk about the ways in which if they're too successful, police interfere in them to try to, you know, disrupt their progress. When we do other things that are about uh, collective care and communities, those things are often criminalized or disrupted. Um, so I think there's there's multiple levels at which police are operating to get in the way of the visions for Black liberation that people are dreaming and fighting for. There's been an ongoing campaign uh, to make us love the cops. And then we turn on TV, there's all these cop shows and all this you know, hey, look at all the good work they're doing. If they wouldn't have done this, then the crime would have been, you know, even worse. So is it a, in your opinion, you know, is it any coincidence that there's all these shows on TV celebrating the uh, the cops in connection to the issues we're discussing here? There's absolutely not a coincidence. And what's interesting about this, and my um, co-author of No More Police, A Case for Abolition, Mariam Kaba, points this out often, which is, you know, what other profession needs such a expansive and continuous PR campaign to justify its existence? You know, we don't have, you know, TV shows glamorizing childcare workers, but none of us could function without them. You know, we don't have TV shows glamorizing sanitation workers, but they are an, in, in, you know, essential part of our society, but we don't have to make the case that they're essential. We all know they are. Um, but when it comes to cops, we have to mount this massive PR campaign. So, um, and we wanted to do it in every culture, in every, you know, TV, film, music, uh, highways. There's not a highway that's not named after a cop. There's not, you know, it's it's constant and it's everywhere. I think I also want to name, though, that there's much more than the cultural aspect of it. I think copaganda is really embedded deeply in and functions with anti-blackness. The the alternate world that we are presented as the world that would exist without police is framed as, you know, this this world of savagery and and uncontained violence and, you know, and there's a profound anti-blackness infusing that vision. And so there's a there's a way in which when we're thinking when people are talking about the purge or they're talking about uh Blade Runner, they're talking about whatever you know, a dystopian future would exist without cops. There's a there's a deep anti-blackness imbued in that, and I think propaganda has been going on for a lot longer than film, TV, uh, etc., and has been part of the the narrative that has traveled with chattel slavery and and the transatlantic slave trade as a as a way of building up slavery and and anti cap and and racial capitalism. And so I think. It, it's a much longer trajectory than, you know, the show Cops or Paw Patrol or whatever. It's it's a trajectory that that came uh, with slavery as a justification for slavery and, and as an afterlife of slavery. For sure. Are you able to share any of those concrete historical examples that, that come to mind for you so we can trace this uh, trajectory, this legacy from the until today? I, I, there's so many, and I, I'm trying to hit on one, but I think in, in so many of the narratives of um, the continent that accompany 
the establishment of chattel slavery and the transatlantic slave trade is the notion that a society without quote unquote civilized order, which is imposed, you know, through settler colonialism and, and racial capitalism and, and the order that uh, produced and benefited from the transatlantic slave trade, a society exists that's completely unregulated, right? In which there is only warring tribes and and short brutish life in which people are in constant competition with each other and um, certainly, you know, is framed as an extremely dangerous place, particularly for white people, right? And so the then police are are framed or and the whether those police are slave patrols, whether those police are armies, whether those police are the military that facilitated the trade are framed as the only and necessary bulwark between that world of savagery and, you know, white civilization, right? And I think you hear that in the way that police talk about Black communities. I was once deposing a cop who said, you don't know that neighborhood, you know, that this arrest took place in, it's the jungle. I was like, first of all, it's my neighborhood. And secondly, it's a neighborhood where people care for each other deeply. And that, you know, in the pandemic, it was so apparent, but it's always been the case that, you know, Black communities look out for each other, that people are are feeding each other, they're caring for each other's children there. And obviously, you know, it's not a monolith, and it's not a universal story, but that's how we've survived to this moment. And um, certainly the societies that are being framed in a particular way in order to justify the imposition of settler colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade um, also operate in ways that were cooperative, that were um, built on collective cultures of care that were um, operating in ways in the direct opposite of the ways in which they're described. And so there's there's so many ways those stories are juxtaposed. I can give one example that we give in No More Police that isn't necessarily um, around Blackness, but it is um, one, a story that's told throughout the colonized um, English world, which is that everyone is required at some point to read Lord of the Flies in middle school or high school, which is a story of, you know, what happens when civilized order is taken away, which includes police and a group of white boys descend into savagery, right? It's a made up story. Um, and it is told, everyone is forced to read it. It's a form of propaganda because it's telling you there has to be a particular order in place in order for that kind of savagery not to happen. When in fact, there are many stories including one we tell in the book of a group of Tongan teens who were shipwrecked um, after taking a boat out for a joyride and, and getting caught in a storm and were shipwrecked on an island for 18 months. The story was the opposite of The Lord of the Flies, right? Um, it was a story of cooperation, of collective survival, of creating a school together, of creating music together, of coming up with creative conflict resolution strategies because they knew their survival depended on each other and on working through difference and working together. So. I think that's just one example that we raise up, but I think there's there's so much more in the way that history is told and the anti-Blackness that infuses the way history is told that manifests in the present in the way that people think about a world without police as as one um, that is infused with violence rather than than the opposite, which is more likely to be true. When it comes to the resource part of it, mentioning that they're stealing resources, is this where the ideas of defund the police have come into play in terms of the recent uh, more public shouting of these terms, let's say, from from different folks and movement spaces? Absolutely. I think I think it's a recognition of the fact that in in many black communities that have experienced what Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls organized abandonment, there's only one number to call. And that number, you know, when you need assistance, and that number comes with with violence, handcuffs, and criminalization uh, is the only response. And there's literally no other resources in the community other than more police. And then the the af the the natural consequences of having no resources in a community are then criminalized and then used to justify pouring more money into police. And so I think the defund the police is a very simple demand it's and that's why it has caught on because it's just it's literally take money away from death making institutions that are perpetrating and promoting violence in our communities and give money to the things that will bring us closer to that vision of black liberation 
places and spaces where people can learn together, where people can grow together, where people can engage in, in conflict generatively together, where people can grow their own food, where people can uh, play, where people can learn from elders, where people can learn language. I mean, there's so many things that can be done in space when we, um, when we have the resources and, 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 and legitimize those things as things that make communities whole um, and help them thrive and, and reduce the incidence of violence in those communities. So I think, I feel like that's an important point. I do want to, because we're in a history podcast, um, talk about the fact that while defund the police is a, a term or a phrase that rose to national prominence in 2020, that Black organizers in Oakland had been using that term, you know, much earlier, starting in 2015. And also that it actually came comes from the Black Panther Party platform. I mean, it says we want an end to police brutality and murder of Black people, and we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. Sounds like defund the police demands to me, and I, I just want to make sure that we know because I think there's been a lot of conversation about defund coming from outside black communities. And it's a demand deeply rooted in black communities. And, and in, you know, even before that time, but that's certainly kind of a more modern manifestation of it. And it also comes from incarcerated people. There was a group called the North Carolina Prisoners Labor Union in 1974, calling for an end to the judicial parole prison industrial complex. That's incarcerated black people saying this needs to stop. And then, you know, I mentioned being part of anti-apartheid struggles earlier. I mean, that's a defund the police demand, right? We were, we were literally saying stop funding this militarized regime in South Africa and, and put our resources into, into the liberation as self-determined by black people in South Africa. That was also a demand to defund police. So it's a current iteration and it's a very simple thing. And, it, and it's not the end of point of that. It's not going to take it us all the way to the dream of Black liberation that we're talking about, but it's definitely a first step that needs to happen. And that's, I think, the power of the demand and how it has supported or facilitated Black organizers across the country in engaging thousands and thousands of community members in a conversation about where do we want to put our resources and what's going to, what kinds of resource distribution and investment is going to bring us closer to those dreams? I appreciate you sharing the history of that and absolutely want to make sure we're lifting up the work that's been going on for, uh, for decades at the, at the least. So I appreciate, appreciate that. Um, with these more recent, um, I guess more publicized um, calls for defunding, uh, I agree that it is great that it's got folks talking and imagining and building uh, folks that may not have been involved in these conversations before. Um, it seems that there's probably also opportunity for the conversation to be co-opted or a message to be diluted. Um, have you seen that in your work? Absolutely. And I think the, the first co-optation was um, an effort to say, well, people don't really mean take their budgets to zero. They just mean maybe if we're doing some cost trimming everywhere, we should do a little cost trimming there. Or, and then, you know, when that didn't work, the co-optation began to, um, you know, seek to, to leverage the fact that for so many folks who experience multiple forms of violence in black communities, there is no other solution, right? There's no other resource offered. And so to then, use that fact and the fact that people were saying, well, we need something in our communities. <laughs> we don't necessarily want police, but we need something. Um, and to use that against um, defund organizers to say, look, people in Black communities don't agree with your demand when consistently, whether you measure it by polling or you measure it by how people vote with their feet or the number of people who show up to build safety in communities or talk about how to build safety in Black communities without and beyond police, there's tremendous support in, in Black communities for the, for the things that underlie the demand to defund. But I think one way that co-optation happened was this effort to sort of find people in Black communities and leaders in Black communities who, who were saying things like, well, no, we, we need the police. When in fact, what they're saying is we need resources and we need 
to transform the conditions that are producing tremendous amounts of violence in our communities. And I think that was an effort of co-optation that um, certainly some folks were willing participants in, uh, but I, I really, I feel like it, it it was an, an effort to sort of cover over the fact that people are demanding resources, they're demanding safety, they're demanding opportunities to prevent, intervene in and transform violence. And if the only thing on the menu is cops, then people, even if the cop, you know, calling the cops, like I said, is a, is a game of Russian roulette, people are going to say, well, if it's that or nothing, then we want something. And I think that's where, again, the propaganda is, it's an on and off switch, right? It's cops on or cops off. That's it. And it doesn't recognize that there's so many other things that have been proven through research and experience that we could invest in instead that, that reduce violence in black and communities and under resourced communities in very documented ways um, that aren't being uh, offered or considered in that conversation. So then that's, I think that's a, a way that co-optation has happened that has been concerning. And then I, the third thing I'll say is that, you know, this narrative started that this was, you know, coming from white privileged gentrifiers and it wasn't coming from black organizers. And, and politicians were saying that to the face of black organizers and not black organizers who look like me, black organizers who, you know, undeniably, incontrovertibly coming from the same communities that they were talking about, um, that the politicians were talking about when they were saying, you know, it's, it's not coming from those communities. And people were standing there being like, you, I'm right here. <laughs> I'm right in front of you telling you that this is coming, coming, not just, you know, from the organizers, but from, from people in the communities that they represent. So I, f- I feel like that was a moment where a lot of folks who were organizing in black communities were just, just flabbergasted at, the word my mother would use, but who who were just shocked. I think in New York City, particularly, we heard that from you know black women in on city council were saying, you know, this is not something to do with black communities, and and they knew black women organizers in their own communities who were leading these fights, and so it was this, this very strange sort of invisibilization and discounting of people who were visibly um, out there and had been part of organizing for safety in their community for decades because the politicians didn't like the demand. You have these politicians on a local level um, that are seem to be turning a blind eye to the reality that they know to be true. Whose interest does that serve if it's not serving those that they are supposed to be working for? No, it's serving the interests of power and it's serving the interests of the current structures, right? And I think there's, and obviously not all politicians are the same, um, but there's definitely a, a bias towards the existing structures of power. And I think then people (laughs) try and resolve that by advancing things like the, what was called the Justice and Policing Act, which would have produced neither justice nor would it have prevented the killing of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor. And what it would have done actually is pour $850 million back into police departments, right? And so, you know, that was something that was being advanced by politicians, including black politicians who were claiming that this was you know, their response to the murder of of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, which would only have poured more resources into the very institutions that, that made that possible and perpetrated it. So I think there's, they're preserving the status quo. And I don't, it certainly doesn't serve the interests of the vast majority of black people. And um, certainly in communities that are under-resourced and subject to the highest rates of police violence. When it comes to broadening our imagination and uh, moving past the status quo, you mentioned that the there's evidence that shows that there's better investments that can be made within the communities. What are some of those most sort of high leverage investments that we could be thinking about and discussing and advocating for in our communities? I think it depends on every community. And so the study I'm thinking of uh, found that there was a proportional decrease in the amount of violence, you know, as defined by homicides or, um, you know, premature death and other forms of violence. There was an inverse relationship between the number of community organizations and and the amount of violence, right? The more community organizations, the less violence. And so... I think what those community organizations are and do depends on the individual needs of each community. But I think across the board, housing, healthcare, and access to 
a basic guaranteed income that enables you to feed yourself and your family have been shown to be very effective in reducing people's vulnerability to violence and also people's likelihood to engage in violence, either because the only economies they can participate in are criminalized economies or because they are trying to survive or they're trying to navigate use of criminalized substances or they're trying to, they haven't received the support they need to, to um, heal from trauma. You know, it's, it's, it's not, structural violence is not only about the distribution of violence and the distribution of economic opportunity. It's also about distribution of opportunities to heal from violence. And in black communities have never been offered the resources um, or opportunities to heal from violence that, are warranted certainly given the legacies and afterlives of slavery and and the generational trauma that has resulted and then the ongoing trauma of of anti-blackness and, and particularly manifested through the violence of policing and the organized abandonment. So I think for me that's um, those are the places what the re- where the resources need to go. So you know, reparations would be, you know, as one framework that has been used to talk about what kinds of investment need to happen. And it's not just the financial compensation. It's not just the economic, cultural, social compensation. It's really healing resources, opportunities to heal individually and collectively as communities. So I think those, we can't underestimate those. So I, I want to lift up, for instance, um, uh, Dream Defenders in Miami have created a, a center um a healing and trauma center where that yes there are teams going out and interrupting violence there are teams responding to crisis calls but there's also healing opportunities that people who have experienced violence youth who have been traumatized by violence in their communities can come to heal from those experiences or the chicago torture justice center is a center for everyone who's been impacted by the violence of policing in chicago and it's a place where people can engage in politicized healing. They can come in to talk about the trauma of police violence, but they can also talk about how they can heal by resisting that violence, how they can heal by getting their comrades out from inside, how they can heal by being in community and supporting young people in healing from violence or preventing violence. So there's, those are things that are specific to those two communities and each community has its own, you know, conditions that that require particular kinds of investments. But I think um, those are the basics, meeting people's material needs and offering people opportunities to heal. So in those examples you just gave, are those initiatives sponsored by the state in any way? Are there resources being directed to them away from police? I'm not sure about the uh, Dream Defenders one. I do know that Dream Defenders have been fighting for divestment from policing and that they were fighting for investment in a pilot program that would be connected with their center somehow or would be modeled after their center. So I know that they are definitely in that struggle um, to move resources out of policing and into similar situations. The Chicago Torture Justice Center is an interesting example because it was Um, One, so it does receive state funding through the first uh, reparations ordinance for um, providing reparations to people who experience police violence, Uh, black, uh, over 100 black men and women who were tortured by police on the south side of Chicago over a period of decades, many of them into confessing to crimes and then doing time on death row, doing decades in prison, and so on. And through a very long struggle um, uh, and a historic struggle led by the survive, people who have been tortured, the families and Black communities, there was an ordinance passed in 2015 that that articulated a reparations plan for those people, those hundreds of people who had been tortured, but then included sort of these broader, because reparations is about broader things, right? It's about compensation and rehabilitation for the people who have been harmed, but it's also about cessation and non-repetition and transforming the conditions that made the violence possible. So one of the things that was created was the Chicago Torture Justice Center. So it is state funded, but through a reparations frame, not a charity frame. If I'm understanding correctly, both of these examples at least started just within the community themselves and then found a model that they wanted to build on and found ways to support it um, through the state, or at least, uh, what's the word, subsidize it to some extent. 
Yeah, and I think that's that's the key is that each community has already have solutions. You know, one thing I was been struck by um, was a book called The War on Neighborhoods about the west side of Chicago, a community called Austin, which is sort of the quintessential example of organized abandonment, right? And a, a predominantly black community. And what's heartbreaking, there's so many heartbreaking things about the story of that community, but one of the things that's most heartbreaking is that they have a plan. They developed a plan for development of their own community that circused around like a closed down factory and what they were gonna do with it. And they had a whole economic development plan and it has just sat there. And then the only thing that the city has offered instead has been more and more and more and more cops and more and more and more tanks and more and more, you know, um, surveillance cameras and, and just more and more stories about how violent and, you know, um, dangerous that community is, which people then internalize as, oh, well, then we need more cops. And so I think it's a really... I think there are many, many, many communities where so many people have so many ideas about how to get closer to those dreams of black liberation and and communities where everyone can not just survive, but thrive and reach their highest potential. And the state day after day after day makes the conscious choice to put money into cops instead of those dreams, instead of those ideas, instead of those things that might fail, but might lead us to information about what might succeed. And so I think for me, that's the the heartbreaking piece is that there's an assumption that communities don't have an abundance of ideas um, about how to improve and uh, conditions and reduce violence and that they're constantly underfunded or not funded. Yeah. Yeah. I think the state and politicians just be feeling themselves too much and think they're the only ones with ideas. Uh, and usually, as you mentioned, they're status quo ideas that aren't really making movement in the communities. So what types of conditions need to exist in order for uh, a community to be successful in you know, creating these organizations and then scaling them up? And, and I guess when I, let me get even more specific. So when it comes to the community supporting itself and its own organizations and actions um, to lead to this state you mentioned where, I think you mentioned with more organizations, there's less violence. So what, what conditions need to exist in order to, to get there? I think we just have to continue to fight to liberate the resources from the state um, and get them into the hands of communities. And we have to also continue to fight to divest power from policing and systems of policing and punishment that will come crush those experiments um, as soon as they perceive that they're threatening the status quo in some kind of way. So I think it's a two pronged thing, which is why you know defunding the police is taking money and power away from police and putting it in communities achieves kind of both those uh, prongs. I think that we need to build power to do that. And I think we saw in 2020 what happened when 26 million people came out in the street to say enough. This we we are can no longer tolerate this level of violence of policing and really create a, a crisis of legitimacy for policing. I think, you know, unprecedented, at least in this generation, although there's been many crisis points over um, centuries. And and I think we need to continue to build that power and continue to build with community members and really break the hold of propaganda on our heads. So I think it's a two pronged strategy. It's going out into communities and constantly speaking to people about what do you need to be safe? When What makes you feel safe? When's the last time you felt safe? How do we create more of that? What, you know, how do we understand safety as something that we build in relationship with each other, not something that Coca-Cola can sell us or the state can sell us, right? How do we understand our responsibility to and for each other and be willing to, to take action towards that? So it's those conversations that need to happen and those conversations need to also build the power to make the demands on the state to say, we refuse to accept that you put millions of dollars into something to surveil or police or punish us when we have these these initiatives that we know will create more safety in our community, where we have these needs that are unmet and the way people are responding to the needs being unmet is getting their needs met 
however they can do it. And sometimes that involves violence, right? How we can, how, you know, you need to, to address these realities. People have fought for guaranteed income in some communities. They've fought for um, fellowships for people who are involved in the most violence to say, well, if we gave you a fellowship and an opportunity to do something else, would you do something else? And the answer is universally yes, right? People um, are, are contributing to their communities in other ways. So I think the the answer, you know, what needs to happen really is is to continue to build opportunities to dream in communities of and to recognize what would bring folks closer to those dreams, bring communities closer to those dreams, and then fight the state for resources to make those dreams possible and to defend those dreams against uh, the repression by police and other forces that don't want those, don't want our black liberation dreams to come true. So when fighting the state, how can folks be thinking about voting and electoral politics as it relates to uh, this discussion we're having, these actions that need to be taken? I'm more, I mean, obviously people need to exercise power in every way that they can. And it doesn't by any means stop at the ballot booth, right? Like it just, it, in fact, you know, it's sort of, as we talk about, it's a task, but it's not the, it's not the be all of the, the work. I'm far more inspired by the work of formations like Black Nashville Assembly or Jackson People's Assembly or other places, Southern People's Assembly, where people are coming together to practice new forms of governance together that are forms of governance that are informed by, shaped by, and practicing those Black liberation dreams. And, and thinking about how and practicing, learning, and trying um, and embodying new ways of, of thinking about how we distribute resources, how we distribute power, how we make power with each other instead of power over each other, and then how we take that power to the current systems and, and, and seize it. So I think um, those formations for me are much more inspiring than trying to figure out, and again, this is where sort of not being from the United States um, shapes my thinking too. I just, it's a, it's a no win game here. <laughs> you know, you're like, and it's not like, you know, other places I've lived don't have sort of a, a spectrum that of parties that's similarly, you know, right, less right, slightly less right, slightly less right center. Right. You know, that's no, but I think that um, there's more room for strategizing in spaces that aren't locked into a two party system in which, you know, one party is explicitly trying to kill us and the other party is trying to kill us softly. You know, I think it, there's, it's, it's really a difficult framework to be stuck in. And I think that what gives me hope and inspiration is when is all the ways in which black people have consistently creatively operated outside of it because it's never been for us. Can you help us build our imagination today, right? So you mentioned Jackson People's Assembly, you mentioned a couple other formations. Can you share how some of these other formations work? I mean, it's simple. It's a participatory form of governance or other folks are engaged in participatory budgeting. People in the community with a stake, no matter whether they have uh, been criminalized, have a conviction, whether they're under 18, whether they're citizens of the U.S., everyone is welcome in a people's assembly. People come together and everyone has a stake in decision making. People name their problems together. They together uh, come to uh, an analysis of their current conditions and who has the power to shift those conditions. And then they they build together um, their collective solutions and the power to enact them. It's it's really, um, whether it's the Jackson's People's Assembly, you know, there was a collapse of the water situation. Jackson People's Assembly figured out how to get water and distribute it, right? And, and um, in Black Nashville Assembly, people had many deep conversations about what they would do with a budget. Like, wh- how would they shape Nashville's budget? And had conversations as a community about how to do that and and how they would distribute resources. And then in other places, um, Seattle, there was a, a group called the Black Brilliance Project that 
did a research project with hundreds of researchers in community, just going and talking to people about what safety looked like for them, what they needed, and produced a 1200 page report that has a blueprint of how participatory budgeting could distribute funding to the things that community people in community said they needed to build safety, to build connection, to build thriving communities. So the way they work is it's, it's almost deceptively simple. It's you build relationships um, with each other. And as a collective, you analyze your conditions based on the knowledge that lives inside each of us about what we know will make us um, safer, will enable us to thrive, will enable us to connect, will enable us to belong. And then you build something based on that. That's incredible and inspiring. And I, um, I'm i curious, with something like participatory budgeting um i would i don't know if i'm even going out of limb like most folks in america uh in our communities probably have not considered themselves ever being part of the budgeting process for the, the local government can you describe how folks can get involved in something like this or advocate for something like this in their communities uh, one example from Phoenix, an organization called Poder in Action, which is mostly made up of Latinx folks, um, just hosted community conversations. People got together with their friends, their family over dinner, talked about what kinds of things or programs they needed in their communities. And then folks wrote up those ideas. Then 100 people who participated in those smaller conversations came together for a larger conversation. They wrote everything up on the wall People put a check mark behind beside the ones, you know, they were given five check marks and they put check marks beside the ones that were most important to them. And, you know, then they're putting attaching money to those proposals and they're pre preparing a people's budget. There's many uh, Seattle Solidarity budget did a similar process. I think it's really inviting people into a process of collective governance and of, of agency and ownership over their their communities and their resources. So the catch with participatory budgeting is there is a political education process that needs to be involved, right? So the first time participatory budgeting happened in my community, a predominantly black community in um, Brooklyn, the number one thing people wanted was more surveillance cameras to catch people engaged in violence, et cetera, right? By the five years later, the thing people wanted was after school programs, you know, um, the kinds of things we're talking about, right? You know, mediation, conflict mediation programs, all kinds of other things in the community, greenways, you know, lights on after dark, whatever. But because of this question that we were talking about in terms of what's in our imagination as the only path to safety, cops, surveillance, control, containment, punishment, we have to be in a conversation about, well, but do those surveillance cameras, are they really going to stop the thing? Or are we just going to be able to, what? see something after it's already happened or what are we really going to see because it's you know but what it will allow them to see is everything else that we're doing every day and how is it going to criminalize other people so it, there has to be a conversation in the context of participatory budgeting the other catch too is that often cities will set aside you know one million or ten million for participatory budgeting in a multi-billion dollar budget in which the cops are taking 11 billion right so then they say, oh, the participatory budgeting didn't solve the problem because we, you know, threw a drop of water into a starving field and nothing grew there. And then, you know, we said, oh, see, it didn't work. <laughs> you know, so I think we have to figure out um, how to expand the scope of that. But there's, there's, um, it's a, it's a process of of making proposals, of voting on them, of uh, pricing them, of sourcing someone who can do the the programs or create the programs that folks need or build them and and go from there. There's a lot to be done, a lot of work to be done. And I do believe that the power is with the people. Uh, we just have to activate it in a certain way. Um, if that is the case, um, what do we need to believe about ourselves in order to take the necessary actions about ourselves and the world we live in uh, if it's not aligned with this status quo that we've been discussing? I think we need to believe in our power and possibility to build and live otherwise. And 
that requires us to spend time in imagination, whether that imagination space is Wakanda or that imagination space is the, you know, playground on the block, but we need to believe in our power to dream and build towards something otherwise and live otherwise. We have to believe about ourselves that we're not what the people in power imagine have, have imagined that that what they've imagined is not the only possibility that we have to live inside of and struggle inside of and die inside of and i think that's that's the main thing we have to believe in our own power and possibility and we have to believe in particularly our own power of love and connection and relationship and in our responsibility for ourselves and each other we have to believe that in our own power to heal and our own power to heal each other in relationship. And, and we have to believe in the world in whatever our black liberation dream is. The only antidote to what is, is what we can dream and make possible. And so we have to, we have to believe in our black liberation dreams. Andrea, thank you for joining us on Black History Year. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for this podcast. To learn more about Andrea Ritchie and her work and her books, visit andreajritchie.com. That's andreajritchie.com. At Push Black, we agree with Marcus Garvey when he said, a people without knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And I'm guessing you probably feel like that's important too. I mean, you're here at the end of a podcast about black history. You matter. Your choice to be here matters. It lets us know that you value this work. And you make Push Black happen with your contributions at blackhistoryyear.com. Most folks do five or 10 bucks a month, but really everything makes a difference. Thank you for supporting the work. Black History Year is a production of Push Black, the nation's largest nonprofit black media company. Our team includes Tariq Alani, Brooke Brown, Tasha Taylor, and Lily Workna. Producing this episode, we have Sydney Smith and Lynn Webb for Push Black, and Ronald Young Jr., who also edits the show. Black History Year's executive producers are Michael L. Sessa for Lemon House and Julian Walker for Push Black. Peace.